Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we have with us Patty Rose from the Purdue Healthcare Advisors, who's going to talk to us about some PQRS information. Again, um, we do have a couple little uh, housekeeping things to go over, the first of which is that I appreciate if anyone has called in to use the mute uh, function on their phone to help cut down on some of the background noise we occasionally get. It helps the presentation flow a bit more smoothly. If you are online and want to chat in a question, you can do so by hovering your mouse at the bottom of the screen and selecting the chat function. You can use that to ask questions during the presentation, and I will moderate a short Q&A session at the end of Patty's presentation. And in the meantime, I will go ahead and turn it over to Patty. Again, if anybody has any questions, please do use the chat function. Great. Thanks, Allie, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining today. And as Allie mentioned, I will be talking about uh, the Physician Quality Reporting System, PQRS 2016. Basically, uh, a basic overview or survival guide. So uh, we'll get started. Uh, on agenda for today, we're, I'm going to define PQRS first of all. We'll talk about individual versus group reporting. We'll talk about the PQRS measures the various reporting methods, and I'll touch base a little on the value-based payment modifier, quality tiering, and then lastly, we'll have a little action plan for PQRS reporting. First off, what is PQRS? PQRS is a quality reporting program that uses negative payment adjustments to promote reporting of quality information by individual eligible providers, or EPs, and group practices. Those who don't satisfactorily report PQRS measures for covered Medicare physician fee schedule services furnished to Medicare Part B beneficiaries will be subject to a negative payment adjustment under PQRS. Uh, Railroad Retirement Board, Medicare Secondary Payer, and Critical Access Hospitals, or CHA Method 2, are also included in PQRS reporting. So who is eligible to report PQRS? Eligible equals required. There's no registration to report PQRS. Any provider who sees a Medicare Part B beneficiary, MDs, DO, NP, PA, and therapist, speech, occupational, and physical therapist. I've noted at the bottom of the screen a link to a complete list of providers that are eligible to report PQRS as well. Individual EPs report data to CMS at a TIN or MPI level, while PQRS group practices report their data to CMS at the TIN level or tax ID level. It is possible for providers to have to report PQRS more than once if practicing at two different locations or tax ID numbers. So this is especially important to note, um, just be uh, aware that if a, a provider is practicing at two different TINs, that they are subject to PQRS. So that's something to uh, pay attention to. Most services payable under the fee schedules or methodologies other than MPFS are not included in the 2016 PQRS. Some of those are services provided under FQHC or Federal Qualified Health Centers or rural health clinics, uh, portable x-ray suppliers, independent laboratory, including place of service code 81, hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, ambulance providers, and ambulatory surgery center facilities as well. And of course, the PQR incentive and penalties. Unfortunately, incentives uh, were ended in 2014, so no, there is no longer an incentive to report PQRS. However, there are penalties. Penalties are seen on claims two years following the reporting period. So let's say right now we're in reporting year, uh, performance year 2016, which PQRS reporting is for a full year. You would not see a penalty if you did not report PQRS until calendar year 2018. And that would be seen as a 2% adjustment on your claims data. Uh, in 2016, uh, the current year that we're in, EPs that did not report in 2014 will see a 2% payment adjustment on their Medicare Part B claims. Here is a little snapshot of the penalties. So on your left here, uh, reporting year and then the penalty year. We have reporting PQRS measures and then they have the year, like let's see, we're in year 2016. Uh, to avoid the penalty, performance year is 2016, the penalty would occur in 2018 for not reporting 
PQRS or not successfully meeting all the criteria when you submit your PQRS measures. That's something to keep in mind. Another little snapshot here is just a, an estimate uh, risk by provider for 2016. So uh, the PQR adjustment is negative uh, 2% for not reporting PQRS or unsuccessfully reporting. Uh, for an MD DO, let's say on the average, it would be $2,000. The max, it could go up to $335,000. For other providers, PAs or NPs, about six fifty. dollars And again, this is just an, an approximation. It depends on the level of services that that provider uh, provides. And then the value-based modifier, which I haven't talked about yet, but I will in a few more slides. Uh, value-based modifier and PQRS kind of go hand in hand. You have to do PQRS, report PQRS successfully, or you're going to get a value modifier adjustment of a negative 4%. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in the later slides. Uh, and again, it just shows an average and then a max. So, uh, you know, if you don't do PQRS, it's 2%, and then you'll get slapped with a negative 4%. So it's a total of 6% on your Medicare PALP via allowables that you would receive a penalty. How do providers report PQRS? Uh, the reporting period, like I mentioned, is a full calendar year in 2016. Uh, you choose whether you want to report as an individual, which is per NPI, or as a group, which is per tax ID number. Choose your measures. The minimum amount of measures to report are nine measures across three national quality standard domains or one measures group. You choose your reporting method, we'll talk about more of that shortly, and report your measures before the deadline. Normally, the deadline to report PQRS is the end of February of the following year. So for 2016, you'll have to the end of February of 2017. However, it depends on what reporting method you choose. And we'll talk about that a little, a few more slides here as well. And here's just a quick snapshot of your PQRS measures. There are 281 individual measures that are available to report on. Uh, diabetes, heart failure, coronary eye disease, as you can see, there, there's a large assortment of different measures, and you'll want to choose measures that apply to your provider's scope of practice. So I highly recommend reviewing this list, and again, the minimum amount of measures are nine that need to be reported. So in choosing your measures, uh, these are a few things that you need to consider. Uh, like I mentioned, clinical conditions usually treated types of care that your providers normally provide, the setting where the care is delivered, and then what quality improvement goals for your, the current year are your practice working towards. Uh, other in quality improvement, reporting niches that are out there, uh, you may be participating in patient-centered medical home, million hearts, or meaningful use. These are all things you have to think about when you're choosing your measures. You also need to review the measures selected. So reviewing measure specifications for the selected reporting mechanism for each measure under consideration is very important. Uh, first off, you select those measures that apply to services that your providers most frequently provide. Uh, look at the EPs or eligible providers or PQS group practices should review each measure's denominator coding to determine which patients may be eligible for the selected PQRS measure or measures. How is a measure calculated? There are two percentages calculated for PQRS, reporting rate and performance rate. Your reporting rate, must you must report at least 50% of all Medicare Part B patients that are eligible for the chosen measure for the measure to be reported successfully. Performance rate looks at, uh, must be greater than 0% unless reporting an inverse measure. Um, an inverse measure, those are measures where the lower value of the measure indicates a better quality and it's acceptable to have a zero performance rate or zero score. For example, diabetes. You, have, you would like to have a lower rate, which indicates better performance. So it's okay to have a zero score on the diabetic measure. Uh, this is, like I said, called an inverse measure. Anatomy of a PQRS measure. Um, I chose measure number 438, and again, there are many measures, but these are, uh, uh, this is just kind of a snapshot of a measure specification sheet, and I'll just highlight the things that should be looked at. Um, first off, this one is statin therapy for prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. It lists on the top box here, the national quality strategy domain is effective clinical care. 
and then it will list uh, your 2016 PPRS options. This is for individual measures. Now, if this particular measure was for group reporting, it was note that right here on top. And this is for registry only. Uh, the description gives you a brief description of what this measure is looking at. For this one, it's looking at the percentage of patients all considered at high risk of cardiovascular events. And then it lists uh, groups, the age group that it's looking at is 21 years or older and also 40 to 75 years with a diagnosis of diabetes uh, with a fasting or direct LDL level as such. And then it will have an area of instructions where how is this measure being measured? This measure is to be reported once per reporting period for patients seen during the reporting period for this particular measure. So it's real important that the specification sheets for each measure that you are considering be reviewed closely. So more on the anatomy, uh, again, there's instruction area, and then there'll be a measure reporting via registry. And I won't go through each, each area. You can go ahead and, and review this on your own, just kind of highlighting what's contained in the specification sheets. Um, but it's very important to review. Let's see, there is also uh, denominator and numerator information. Uh, each individual specification sheet will list what, what it's looking at in your EHR. For this one, the denominator, uh, patients 21 years at the beginning of the measurement period with a clinical arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease diagnosis. Then it looks at uh, your numerator, should be in the next screen, numerator reporting. And then it goes into some definitions and such. Um, these are very valuable. Uh, you may, these are even used for quality improvement as the rationale section of the specification sheet. Pretty much gives evidence-based criteria what, what the measure is looking at. Uh, it may be helpful in quality improvement within your organization as well. And then the national quality strategy domains. Uh, as I mentioned, you have nine measures minimum uh, reported across three NQS domains. Some of you might be familiar with these NQS domains as they are the same domains that are used for meaningful use reporting. Patient and family engagement, patient safety, care coordination, population and public health, efficient use of healthcare resources, and clinical process effectiveness. So your PQS reporting options. You have the option of reporting either as an individual provider or report as a group. For individual reporting, it allows the NP EPs to report measures based on their own NPI. The group reporting allows groups, two or more eligible providers that have reassigned their billing rights to a tax ID number or 10 to report measures together. So for individual reporting, your options are claims, direct EHR or data submission vendor, a qualified PQRS registry, and clinical quality data registry. Again, nine measures minimum across three domains. First off, I'll touch base on claims-based reporting. I'm just gonna speak on this briefly because uh, normally you need to start, uh, it is August, you need to start in the beginning of the reporting year, which January you would have start to successfully report via claims in January of 2016. So just kind of a quick overview, EPs indicate PQRS measures uh, are being reported on a claim by using a series of uh, diagnosis code, ICD codes, uh, QCD quality codes, and CPT codes. These codes define diagnosis and clinical conditions. So time has passed uh, to report via claims, but this option is still there. It's been around forever. It, there's a lot of room for error in claims reporting. If a claim goes out without, and it could have been reported a, a PQRS measure, it goes out to CMS, you can't two days later say, oh, I forgot to put the PQRS codes on there. Go back, put them on the claim and resubmit. CMS won't count it. So there's a lot of room for error and uh, it's not the best way to report PQRS, but it is available. Then you have your qualified PQRS registries. Uh, this is the most popular on the clients that I work with. Uh, qualified registries are aggregate measures and calculate the data on behalf of their EPs. Uh, you can report nine measures over three domains or a one, a one measures group. We'll speak on measures group here shortly as well. Uh, PQRS registries uh, provide you with specific instructions on how and when to submit data for the selected measures or measures groups on which you choose to report. Of note, uh, there are, is a list out there that CMS provided of PQRS registries that are certified. Uh, there are vendors, there is a cost per provider to use a registry, uh, usually between 200 to 350, depending on the registry you choose, 
Uh, some registries are better than others, and uh, you know, it's really I highly recommend reviewing the list of registries that are available for you uh, to make sure that they are able to report the measures that your provider or group practice chooses. Then we have cross-cutting measures. Cross-cutting measures are for claims reporting or registry reporting only. And out of the nine measures that you choose, one of them must be a cross-cutting measure if the EP has had at least one face-to-face -face encounter with a Medicare beneficiary. General office visit, outpatient visits, surgical procedures, however, CMS does not consider telehealth visits as a face-to-face -face encounter. PQRS measure groups, uh, I mentioned earlier, there are a list of 25 available different measure groups. Uh, there are, when you choose a measure group, let's see you were gonna do a diabetes measures group. There's usually between oh, uh, five to seven measures within this diabetes measures group, let's say. Uh, you report on 20 applicable patients, 11 of which must be Medicare Part B. So the other patients could be Blue Cross or any a commercial insurance. So that's kind of uh, good, but not all companies or practices are able to report a measures group. Uh, again, you need to review the measure specification sheets and the and individual measures group to see if your providers would meet every measure within this measures group. So it's something to consider. Then you have direct EHR reporting. Uh, again, uh, I would highly recommend reaching out to your vendor. Uh, what is your EHR capable of reporting regarding PQRS? Uh, your vendor may be able to report directly out of their system, um, they, uh, which basically uploads your PQRS measures or eCQMs, electronic CQMs, to CMS. You must have an individual authorized access to CMS, which is an IAX account. Um, this is a, a Quite the process, maybe you're familiar, uh, it's now called EIDM, Enterprise Identity Management System. Uh, participation in testing with an EHR vendor is strongly encouraged. And all providers must currently be live on the same EHR. There's a data submission vendor reporting. Again, I check with your EHR vendor. Uh, this is an entity that collects an individual EPs or group practices clinical quality data directly from the EP or group practices EHR. Data submission vendors are responsible for submitting PQRS measures data from an EP or group practice EHR to CMS on behalf of that provider or the group practice for the program year. And then uh, another reporting method is a quality clinical data registry or QCDR. QCDR will complete the collection and submission of your PQRS quality measures data on behalf of the provider. You must report one outcomes measure. And basically an outcome measure is uh, it assesses the results of the healthcare that the, are experienced by patients, uh, such as clinical events. Um, a QCDR is different from a qualified registry in that it is not limited to measures within PQRS. A QCDR may submit measures from one or more of the following categories with a maximum of 20 non-PQRS measures. So you have a clinical and group consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems, or CG CAPS, as we like to call it, uh, National Quality Forum endorsed measures, current 2016 PQRS measures, measures used by boards or specialty societies, and measures used in a regional quality collaborations. Some additional information on QCDR. Uh, you may now submit up to 30 non-PQRS measures to CMS on behalf of the provider. Report on at least two outcome measures, which we just talked about. Uh, outcome measures are noted on the 2016 measures list. And reporting as a group, or GPRO. Um, technically, the deadline to register to report as a group ended June 30th of 2016. So uh, if you've registered a group already, great, and chose your method of reporting. However, uh, it's too late to sign up as a group now. You would have to report as an individual. Uh, as, like I said, groups must register their intent to do so, as well as elect which reporting option they will use. Um, registration needed to be completed by June 30th, so that deadline has come and gone. 
but I will speak a little bit on group reporting options. Uh, qual these are the options that are available to report via group or GPRO. You have your qualified PQRS registries, clinical quality data registries, direct EHR or data submission vendor, and CG CAPS survey. Now, if you are a group of 25 to 99 providers, it, it's optional. You, you can choose to report a CDAPS method of reporting. Uh, will only be required to report six measures that cover two quality standard domains. And then it's mandatory for groups of 100 or more providers to use the CG CAP survey. Uh, of note, there is an additional cost for the survey, uh, so that is something to consider as well. CG CAPS surveys, if you're not familiar with them, uh, they, it's a CMS contracted certified survey vendor. It will administer and collect all 12 uh, CG CAPS survey modules. I won't go through each one, but as you can see, you know, from getting timely care to helping you take medication as directed, these surveys will be sent out to patients. Then there is the GPRO web interface reporting option. Uh, if you're an ACO, this is what ACOs use to report their measures, and it also is an option to report PQRS measures. Uh, this is available only for groups of 25 or more providers, a web-based reporting tool, uh, partially pre-populated with patient data based on prior claims. There's 17 measures. Uh, if you have a group of providers of 25 to 99, uh, they need complete information on 248 of their Medicare beneficiaries. Some additional information on the GPRO. Um, group practices of 25 or more must report on all measures in the web interface. And the GPRO, you must populate, like I mentioned, fields for the first 248 consecutively ranked in this group sample for each module or preventative care measure. If you have less than 248, the group practice would need to report on 100% of their assigned beneficiaries. And then meaningful use and PQRS alignment reporting options. Uh, this is something that is available out there for 2016. Uh, to date, I have had none of my clients have reported this way, but it is an option. Just kind of want to throw it out there for you. For, but for individual providers that are reporting via direct EHR or data submission vendor or through a clinical quality data registry, and then if you're a GPRO or group reporting, you can report uh, direct EHR, data submission, or do the CCAP, or the GPRO web interface. Uh, meaningful use measures and PQRS measures, uh, some of them do align. Uh, as you know, the CQMs, uh, if you look at the list of measures, there are measures that, so you can choose to do it this way. I just wanna make note that if you're a first time meaningful use reporter or provider for 2016, you only have a 90 day reporting period, and PQRS wants a full year. So there is kind of the caveat to that is that uh, for PQRS, if you choose to align, report your PQRS measures and meaningful use together or CQM measures, uh, you would need a full year of data. So it delays your meaningful use payment incentive uh, because the, the reporting deadlines to submit this data, um, they don't jive. So just something to, to think about as well. Uh, the MAV, Measure Applicability Validation Process. It's a mouthful. Uh, MAV, maybe some of you have heard, is a process that CMS has come up with that will be applied to any provider that reports on less than nine measures or less than three domains. Uh, it applies to claims and registry reporting only. If the provider passes the MAV process, then they will not incur a negative payment adjustment. Uh, I provided a link on the bottom here that will go into more detail about the MAV process, but basically out of all the measures that you can report on, you can only find eight measures, seven measures. Report on as many measures as you can, minimum of nine, and submit, a, you know, submit the process report to CMS. The, if they find that, that you only have eight measures, then they'll look at your claims data that you submitted for that year and the measures that you submitted. Say, yeah, is this provider really, are they really being honest here? And then if you pass the math process, I, I like to think of it kind of a scrubber, so to speak, um, then you would avoid the negative penalty or payment adjustment to your PQRS. And then your value-based payment modifier or payment adjustments. Uh, some call it VBPM or value modifier, same thing. So value modifier is a budget neutral mechanism that CMS has come up with. Uh, 
VM, the value modifier adjustments are applied two years after the PQRS reporting period. It goes hand in hand with PQRS. Like I said earlier, if you don't do PQRS reporting, you'll get the value modifier or not successfully report PQRS. So in calendar year 2016, CMS will apply the value modifier to groups of physicians with 10 or more providers based on their 2014 PQRS performance. And in calendar year 2017 and beyond, CMS is required to apply the value modifier to all solo providers and groups of physicians, two or more. The value modifier automatic downward adjustment penalty. Uh, there's 2% for groups of two to nine and solo practitioners. And if you're a group of 10 or more, you're gonna get a negative 4% for, for the value modifier for not successfully reporting PQRS. That's again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, for not reporting PQRS, you get a 2% penalty on top of the, and then the value modifier will be an additional negative 4%. So it's a total of 6% penalty on your Medicare Part B allowables. Uh, group practices that report as individuals must have at least 50% of their providers successfully reporting PQRS to avoid this downward adjustment. And then quality tiering. Uh, quality tiering is, is part of the value modifier process. It will help determine if a group's performance is better, the same, or worse than their peers and it identifies statistically significant outliers. It's based on the quality of care, PQRS, and the cost of care measures, or claims data. And the analysis used to determine the type of adjustment, upward, downward, neutral, and the range of adjustment based on performance. All groups and solo EPs will undergo quality tiering analysis for 2017 value modifier based on 2015 reporting. Quality and cost measures. Like I mentioned, quality tiering, it's based on the quality measures that you submit, or PQRS measures, and then the cost measures, which comes in as claims data on the back end. The quality measures include PQRS measures, CG caps measures, only if reported, and then three outcome measures, all cause readmission, composite of acute prevention quality indicators, which are bacterial pneumonia, urinary tract infection, and dehydration, and then a composite of chronic prevention quality indicators, COPD, heart failure, and diabetes. And uh, the cost measures include a total per capita cost measures, which are Medicare Part A and B, total per capita cost for beneficiaries with four chronic conditions, like I mentioned, uh, Medicare spending per beneficiary measures are three days prior and 30 days after an inpatient hospitalization, and all cost measures are payment standardized or risk adjusted. Uh, CMS gives you a, a break for those specialists that see uh, chronically ill patients. Uh, they use a, form, a special formula on the back end. Uh, each group's cost measures are adjusted for specially mix of the EPs in the group. And for, uh, again, um, each group will receive two composite scores, quality and cost, based on the group's standardized performance. How far away from the national mean? So they look at an average of what your providers are based on their peers across the country. Uh, group cost measures are adjusted for specialty composition of the group, and this identifies, like I mentioned earlier, uh, outliers, uh, special uh, providers that are significant uh, barriers and assigns them to their respective cost and quality tiers. I like this. I'm a visual person. Uh, this grid kind of shows you uh, the on the on the left here. You have your clinical care, patient experience, population health, patient safety, care coordination, efficiency. Those are your six national quality standard domains. And at the bottom, you have per capita cost and total per capita cost for beneficiaries with specific conditions. So your six uh, NQS domains go into a quality of care composite score and then your cap per capita cost at the bottom go into a cost composite score. So me, CMS takes that quality of care score and the cost score and they have a special formula that comes up with a value modifier score. So that just is kind of a, a little snapshot of how that flow all kind of works. I, mean, I, I know it's a hard one to wrap your brain around but uh, that kind of helps a little bit. And then the quality tiering payment adjustment. Uh, for solo EPs and groups of two to nine, they are subject to a, an upward or neutral adjustment based on quality tiering. Groups of 10 or more are subject to an upward neutral or downward uh, adjustment also based on quality tiering. 
And this next slide will have a little grid that shows uh, solo EPs and groups from two to nine. So if you have low quality, low cost, you're not gonna get an adjustment. Uh, if you have high cost and high quality, no adjustment. But if you have low cost and high quality, you're gonna get an incentive of 2% times this X factor. And this X factor is a number that CMS comes up uh, from two years back data. So it'd be two times, I think in 2015, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, it was 4.8%, I can't remember. Uh, so just something to think about. Uh, the payment adjustment based on EPs that are 10 or more in a practice. Uh, again, you see that if you have high cost, low quality, that last bucket on the bottom is a negative 4%. So that's a penalty for uh, if you have high cost and then low quality, that's what's going to happen. If you have low cost and high quality, you're going to get a positive 4 times X, the X factor, um, incentive for performing. And not a lot of providers fall into this category, uh, but it is something to, to think about. So uh, that being said, planning for PQRS in 2016. I, uh, the recommended action plan, uh, I should have work with your vendor as the first choice radio button there. Uh, touch base with your vendor. What is my EHR capable of reporting in regards to PQRS? Confirm your eligibility for the PQRS program. You'll need to determine which PQRS reporting method best fits your practice. Report individually or as a group. Review and select your measures. Very important, review the measure specification sheets. And then uh, I always like to, to note that keep up with date with CMS New. If you're not signed up for the CMS listservs, I highly recommend it. Uh, they come out with good information all the time. You gotta keep up to speed. Things are changing um, very rapidly in healthcare. Um, additional recommended steps. Uh, download your 2015 Quality Resource Use Report, or QRUR, which will be available in September of 2016. I've not talked about this today, but uh, I will in a week, I believe I'm presenting another uh, webinar on uh, how to interpret your QRUR. I just wanted to touch base on this uh, and then to review quality measure benchmarks under your value modifier. Uh, I know that the little screenshot is hard to see, but this is a, just a clip of a uh, part of the QRUR report that is downloadable. Um, again, to be able to download your QRUR, you would need a, an EIDM account or formerly known as IAX. So um, you may need to uh, research that if you haven't got one already. And we'll talk more next week on the QRUR. And then I've noted a, a few resources for you as well. Um, I highly recommend the, the, the first uh, radio button, 2016 PQRS Implementation Guide. That is my go-to for everything PQRS. PQRS has done a better job over the years in improving uh, the resources for providers. They've made it uh, easier to understand. So I highly recommend to go to these websites if you haven't already. Um, I've also provided uh, links to payment adjustment information, the value-based modifier. There, there's also a, a FAQs for you, uh, MLN Connects, Provider E-News, great source for getting up-to-date information as new rules and specifications come out. And then the PQRS listserv, great place to sign up if you haven't already. And then how to report once for the medical quality programs. If you're interested in that, I provided the link for that as well. So at that time, this is the end of the, the presentation. If uh, there are any questions out there, I'd be more than happy to answer. I haven't gotten any in through the chat. Um, it's good that you've provided your contact information. We always suggest that if people have questions afterwards to reach out to either Patty or myself. My contact information is uh, A Orwig, O R W A I G, <clears throat> at indianarha.org. Or you can always call the Indiana Rural Health Association offices at 812 478 3919. And uh, again, either Patty or myself can probably get you sorted out. This presentation will be available on our YouTube channel in the next week or so. So if you have any questions after that, of course, anytime. I, I'm sure the two of us are, are happy to help you out. Say, Patty, you didn't get any questions in your chat, did you? No, I didn't see anything come up. So I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. 
you just explained everything perfectly. That's oh, well, well, I'm not sure about that. I know it's complicated stuff. So uh, like, like Ali said, please feel free. Uh, my information is there as well. Uh, shoot me an email or give me a call. I'll be more than happy to help. Okay. Well, we appreciate your time today and hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you. Same to you all.